Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. This is what I call a sticky note Sunday, because I got all my sticky notes up here for my time in prayer this morning. I, have, I don't know if you ever get those moments where you're just so excited you can't stand it. That's one of the kind of mornings I'm having. So I hope that you have that too. It's such an exciting study of God's Word where He has us today in 2 Thessalonians. So we're in study number six. And there's only two more to go. But next week, we have something very important we have to pause our regularly scheduled program for, and that's for Resurrection Sunday. So, yeah, amen. So if you have the, uh, you know, th- maybe, maybe you just have a neighbor you've been chomping at the bit to go and invite, please do that. We've got all kinds of resources out there. You can take those with you, invite your friends and family. And uh, we've got some gifts for everybody. We, well, I won't tell you. It wouldn't be a gift if I told you what it was, now would it? No, we've got some gifts we want to give you. It's not to, you know, bait you in, but it's a thank you for making that uh, your focus to be able to come here and worship. Uh, We have both our normal services, 8 and 10, but if you're looking for a sunrise, Jeff Anderson's going to be speaking over at the Gateway Prayer Garden, and he's going to be doing that at 7 a.m. So as long as you go over there to the 7, you got to get right back here at 8. Or you can do the 7 and then come over here for the 10. You know, you can do that too. Uh, But yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, just do a double duty, right? Go seven, worship, come over here, ten, um, you'll get a double helping. We have uh, just a few things we need to cover beforehand. Firstly, I want to thank everybody who came out yesterday to go and share the gospel with those downtown. We had two teams go out to Acacia Park and Dorchester Park, and uh, we, took, uh, we had an assembly line in here, and I see a number of the folks who were out there yesterday. I want to thank you. Uh, we had an assembly line. We put in blankets, and we had socks and hygiene kits and all sorts of goodies. And then more importantly, we put the Bible and gospel tracts in there. And then we armed ourselves with the gospel tracts, and we went out and shared the gospel with as many people as the Lord would allow us to encounter. And it was a great joy. I think it's always a privilege. It's a joy to those who share. Sometimes you just wonder, is it really going to make a difference? But really, we trust the Lord. You go out, you plant seeds. And I I think sometimes it's, it's actually scarier to share the gospel with family members or with coworkers because you're going to see them again. And so we get a little apprehensive to go and share the gospel with people we know because we're worried about how that's going to affect the relationship moving forward. So we withhold the light instead of giving the light. So if you can start, maybe you just get out of your comfort zone and come join us as we go and give the gospel uh, to folks, you know, who sometimes, uh, you know, we, we pause for a moment as we think about the fact that that's somebody's child that's out there. And maybe it's somebody they haven't heard from in a very long time. And we get the privilege to be able to go and tell them about Jesus, pray with them, and love on them a little bit. Uh, we had some interesting encounters, though, didn't we, yesterday? Um, so with that, it's always a, a challenge. Whenever you're given the gospel message, you're going to hear about that today. There's going to come friction. There's going to, something's going to get stirred up. You can't give light into darkness and not expect that there's going to be change. Something's going to happen to the giver and to the receiver. There's going to be something happening, even in a supernatural space, that when you do that, you're going to cause Satan to even go, ah, i got to stop that one because they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, so I'm going to try to create some obstacles to prevent them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then we retreat instead of doing what we know we ought to do. So that can be start in a conversation with your spouse. Maybe you're unequally yoked, and you need to share the gospel by how you live. Ladies, I want to encourage you that even if you're married to an unbelieving husband, we're, to- we're told in 1 Peter that a woman can even possibly win over her unbelieving spouse by just her countenance alone, by how she represents the Lord in her home. So it starts in our living room, and it moves out even into our workspaces, and sometimes it means going downtown and sharing the gospel. But I want to thank you all for those who made that a priority. Also, uh, and for those of you who prayed. And you just prayed for all those who went out. Also, you notice that there are uh, little palm branches out here. While plastic, they're not, you know, anything really special. I had a, a little girl come up to me earlier. Grace's daughter came up and said, you made a mess, Pastor John. <laughs> and, and I had to apologize. She's right. I did. I made a mess out here. I actually placed all of those. Some of them have been kicked around a little bit. But it's because we're celebrating something today. Or at least recognizing something. Any idea what that might be? Palm Sunday. Okay, but you know as an expository church and given the gospel verse by verse that I have to tell you the truth, right? So we can allow the tradition to say, okay, we're going to come together, we're going to recognize Palm Sunday. But did it actually happen on a Sunday? 
All right. All right. So you know me. I'm going to have to just tell you what it is so that we know that our traditions don't overshadow truth. So you have the truth, but you also understand that traditions also can be a part of this. We talked about that last week, about how sometimes traditions can be a bit misleading. So we have a tradition that says Palm Sunday. When did it actually happen? On a Friday. We're told in John chapter 12 that six days before Passover, Jesus was in Bethany. That's the place where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Not by anybody, but by Jesus. Jesus raised him to life. Six days before this would occur, before Jesus would go to the Passover. Think about that. What what day was man made on? The sixth day. Is there any coincidence in Scripture? No. So he's in the very place where he raised up Lazarus, and it says the very next day that the triumphal entry occurred. Mark chapter 11 then describes this powerful sequence of events in which Jesus comes up to the temple and to be worshipped. Hosanna to the king. And we read in Matthew chapter 21 verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is a fulfillment of what Zechariah 9, 9 had said would happen. It was 500 years Before Jesus fulfilled it, saying, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before that occurred, Jesus would fulfill it exactly 500, well, 500 years later. That's exactly as it was a plan by God to do. Now, he comes on a donkey. We know how all that works. And the reason why we know it to be on a Friday rather than on a Sabbath, do you know it was against Sabbath law that they could not ride on an animal? Nor could they gather palm branches? That's from the, they had five volumes on Sabbath regulation. And in Shabbat 21 verse 9, it says they could not ride on an animal. Nor could they break branches and lay them down or gather them in any way or use them as a switch for the animal that they were riding. So they couldn't do any of that. So if Jesus had done that on a Sabbath, or even on the Sunday, and that would have broken all the timeline, but he certainly couldn't have done it on a Sabbath because everybody would have been in arms. You're breaking the Sabbath. You're riding on an animal. But what happens, the timeline, as we see in Mark chapter 11, he rides up to the temple on a Friday. The night comes. He goes back to Bethany. He comes back the next day as he's on his way looking at the temple, and he comes down, he sees a fig tree. Remember what happened with the fig tree? It was supposed to be producing figs, but it was not. And he curses that fig tree, and it was symbolic of what he was about to do in the temple itself. It was supposed to be producing worship, undefiled worship unto the Lord. We see that they go into the temple, and then Jesus gets to business, start flipping tables starts cleaning out the house. They were taking advantage of people. At the court of Anas, they were upselling everyone. They were there gathering for the feasts. Passover, unleavened bread, feast of first fruits. And they were preparing and buying their sacrificial gift unto the Lord. And they were being overcharged, overburdened. And the Lord looked at this and he said, you've turned it into a den of thieves. He cleans it all up. Worship breaks out to the Lord. The Pharisees are not happy about this. They start questioning Jesus. And of course, he refutes everything perfectly. They thought themselves so clever and cunning. And the Lord defeats them at every turn. Then he leaves. He comes back. And on a Sunday, he gives the Olivet Discourse to his disciples. Powerful sequence of events. So it's important that we understand the sequence because they would have been in preparation for Passover, which would have happened that Tuesday night into Wednesday the next day, which Jesus would be arrested, crucified, and in the tomb before 6 p.m., on Wednesday. Then he would be in the grave Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. How many nights is that? Three Three nights. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. How many days? Three days. Three days and three nights, exactly as he said he would. Then he resurrects sometime after 6 p.m. on Saturday. We don't know when. Sometime that would have been the conclusion of the Sabbath. They come out the first of the day before daylight even breaks, and they find the tomb is empty because the angel revealed it. Pulls open the tomb and shows them the Messiah has resurrected on the feast of first fruits, exactly as he would declare. So Jesus was the first fruits, fulfilled the feast of unleavened bread, fulfilled Passover, everything perfectly in that week. So we observe today 
Palm Sunday, even though it was probably a Palm Friday. But nonetheless, we still recognize the King of kings and Lord of lords. It says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, that he's going to come, and that's going to be written on his thigh, and he's going to come with you, and the Shekinah glory will break out across a blackened sky that will now be so bright it'll look as if it was day, because Jesus Christ will be coming in all his glory to rightfully take his throne. And what a glorious day that will be. So we celebrate the triumphant king. And this whole week, please keep it in mind as we prepare to observe Resurrection Sunday together. Now, the interesting thing is you might be asking, well, wait a minute, why is our Resurrection Sunday by way of the church on March 31st, but Passover is April 22nd? Hmm, how did we get off of the alignment? I know that you're all in your inquisitive minds wondering this very thing, right? (laughs) You came in here going, why are the calendars not aligned, Pastor John? I hope you explain that to us. Well, just in brief, I will tell you that it is very complicated when we operate off a solar calendar, a Gregorian calendar of 365 days. The Hebrew calendar operates off of 354 days. The prophetic calendar off 360. Are you confused yet? So when you have 354 days, it operates off a lunar calendar. Everything goes by that, and it doesn't align with the tradition of the early church. In about the 4th century, they said the first Sunday after the full moon will always be Resurrection Sunday. But that doesn't align with the timeline of the lunar calendar. Oh, and you ready for this? Every three years, there's a leap year adjustment. So we are in the leap year adjustment 29 days has to be accounted for between the Gregorian and lunar calendar. So that's why we have such a discrepancy between March 31st for us and then those who are observing the Passover tradition of the unleavened bread into Feast of First Fruits is almost a month removed. But next year, it completely flips. Passover will be on April 12th and Resurrection Sunday on April 20th. Completely the opposite. It won't be a leap year year. So we've got all these wonderful complications. The bottom line is this. Did you come here to worship Jesus? Then you're in the right spirit and you're in the right place. Because we've got a study to get into of worshiping Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great joy of being here this morning with fellow saints to worship you. I pray that we come with a worshipful spirit The Lord, you would please convict us and and develop and strengthen us that our prayer life even will be different after today. Lord, only you can do that. Information alone will not do it. But you, the God of all creation, can change the hearts of men, can stir us, can soften our hearts to receive, to convict the souls of men that we would do as you have instructed. Would you convict us here today to be a people after your heart, to do as we ought to do, In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today is quite simple. Two points, two point sermon, except for I've got a lot of sub points in the middle. Uh, Faithfulness and perseverance. Faithfulness and perseverance. That's what we're going to be talking about here today, but what we're not going to just talk about it, we're going to learn to pray for those things. Faithfulness and perseverance. So often, what we can do is we can take our Bible and it sits really nicely on a shelf somewhere or it sits on a coffee table somewhere, and we think that by osmosis that somehow we will develop faithfulness and perseverance as just by being closer to this book, perhaps. I would like to encourage you that as you open it and actually read it, you will develop faithfulness and perseverance with a heart that is contrite, repentant, and seeking to walk after our Savior, right? So you've got to actually read it. And when we read it, we will learn it. But it can't just sit on your bookshelf. It's got to be more than that. So today we're going to learn about our prayer life again. You're like, wait a minute, didn't we just study about our prayer life? To which I'll say, absolutely. March 3rd, we were just there talking about our prayer life, and we were studying 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 to 12. But like the treasures in the earth, we must de- dig deeper We've got to mine deeper to receive the most valued of those treasures. And that's what we're going to learn today about a different kind of praying. A praying that actually goes above the ceiling. Something that is amazing that God is going to move in the prayers of his people. And I hope you are 
changed and is, is excited by this as I am. Have you ever heard uh, children pray? All the moms and dads in here are shaking their heads. You know, if you have children, that, oh boy, isn't it just the sweetest thing to hear? And so often it can be like, uh, Lord or God, please bless mommy and daddy. Please bless all the missionaries. Please bless everybody. Amen. And that's so sweet, isn't it? If you hear children, you can almost just hear them say it in your ear right now. The challenge becomes is as we grow up, are we still praying like that? Like kind of just a blanket prayer. All the men going, Lord, just fix my wife in the world, amen. <laughs> and they're just moving on. I mean, because we were like, well, God has already heard what I was going to pray before I prayed it. God already knew I don't need to really get into specific detail. To the contrary, what you're going to find out here is it's absolutely critical that the more we learn here, the more specific our prayers ought to be, even for faithfulness and perseverance, that you can run this race and do the work that God has called us to do. So let's read it. Faithfulness and perseverance, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're only going to cover the five verses here this morning. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So firstly, we've got to pray for faithfulness. Faithfulness specifically for the distribution of the gospel and protection over those who share it. We've got to pray for that. Not just a generic, Lord, pray for all the missionaries and, and Christian people. Let's be specific with this. He says here, verse 1, let's look at it closer. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. There's a lot right there, as you'd expect. So let's stand back from this for a moment. Remember where the Apostle Paul is when he's writing this letter to Thessalonica. He's in Corinth. How far away is Corinth from Thessalonica? If you were to drive it or walk it or fly it, it doesn't really change. If you were to go straight shot there, 358 miles. Corinth is almost directly south of Thessalonica, right near the water's edge. And so it'd be about 358 miles. So if you were to take horse, you would still be about a week's journey. So at least seven days there and at least another seven days back. If you were to drive that, it would be basically for like driving from Pueblo to Grand Junction. So imagine just on horseback making that trek, or even trying to walk that. Why does that matter? Because Timothy, it's Timothy, Silas, and Paul. They're together. Paul and Silas have been run out of town. Remember, an angry mob is trying to get rid of them because the word they've been giving of Jesus Christ is changing the city, turning the whole town upside down. We'd expect that when the gospel is given. So an angry mob is formed against them. They move down south to Corinth, and they're serving in Corinth while they're writing back to the church in Thessalonica. Timothy has the job of going back and forth. This is good for him. He's going to become a pastor later in Ephesus. This is important for him to do this. So this is a young church, about a year old, if that. So you've got a bunch of young converts. The apostle Paul is writing to them. And in the midst of this, not only are they young, they're experiencing persecution right away. They've given their lives to Jesus, and now it's really hard. All kinds of persecution is breaking out. All sorts of things coming out of the throne room of Claudius against them. And Nero is about to take the throne. It's only going to get worse. So they got all this persecution coming against them. The Apostle Paul writes and tells us that there's false teachers among them. That as Paul departed, sure enough, somebody comes in with a different kind of gospel. Starts twisting the word. That never happens, right? So they look like they have their own best intention, but it's not true. So we've got the false gospel now being preached amongst them. And then 
you top it off with the fact that he just preached on the apostasy that was about to happen. There's going to be a separation, a divide. So if you summarize all this, it's basically this. The world is going to reject the truth that's in you. People in the church are going to walk away, and things are going to get tougher. But don't give up. Don't give in. Stand fast. So this is what the Apostle Paul has been trying to encourage them with. Just because it looks like everything is against you, the Lord is for you. Stand fast in truth. Don't give in. Don't take the easy way out. Don't take the path of least resistance. Stand firm in truth. Then the very next thing he asks them for is to pray for their advancement of the gospel. Did you see that? Right after telling them to stand fast, this chapter begins with, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. If I just told you that the election in November is not going to go the way you want and things are going to get tougher economically and all sorts of hardships are going to come upon you, your natural reaction might be to withdraw. We turn into turtles. We want to hide out, self-preserve, and try to fortify the position. We don't want to get on the advance at all. And that's not at all what Paul wants them to do. Keep persevering. Keep pushing ahead. The way you break down your enemies, you go for the jugular. You keep marching forward. You keep giving the gospel. Don't retreat. Press in. Don't get on your heels. Right? So this is quite the opposite. But interestingly, he says, pray for us. Why does he say, I'm praying for you? Well, those who have been in counseling sessions will know this, that when somebody is going through a hard time, The best way to get them out of that hard time is to start to focus on others' needs, to get their focus on a right focus, because the enemy likes to cripple us in depression and anxieties and fears, and many of us are going through that, and many don't even say they are. And the reality is, is in order to get out of that place, he gets the focus on the mission. Pray for us. We need your prayers. Don't get quiet. Don't retreat on your heels just because things are getting tougher. Get more involved. Get involved in somebody else's life. Pray for them, and you'll see how you can start to get a proper perspective in the midst of those adversities. He wants the gospel then to be preached because the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. There's a mission before us. Lives depend on this. Paul is writing from Corinth. Remember how bad I told you Thessalonica was? Greek cities were just wrought with all kinds of immorality, all kinds of temptation everywhere. Corinth was even worse. Corinth, in a way, kind of reminds me a little bit of Colorado Springs in some ways. It was the capital of the Isminian Games. We are Colorado Springs known as the Olympic City. So a lot of athletes would come there, and of course, there was all sorts of temptation, all sorts of sexual immorality and everything that was very prevalent within the city. It was a hard city to be in. And you're thinking, wow, at least I'm not on the city chamber council uh, trying to promote Colorado Springs, right? Uh, But here, this is a reality of this city. This city was a tough place to be. Paul is already concerned there's going to be another riot formed against him. People are going to try to take him down. And so as he comes in there, he needs encouragement, and the Lord Jesus comes to him by way of vision, tells him in Acts chapter 18, do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So while it would have been natural to be fearful and retract, to fortify your positions because you can't take another piece of bad information. Anybody ever feel like that sometimes? You're all cruising along, everything's going good, and all of a sudden, bam! Everything goes to screeching halt. And then you don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to share any emails. You don't want any text messages. You just want to retract a bit. And here the Apostle Paul is reminded from the Lord himself, do not be afraid, but speak. Go boldly. Speak the truth. 
Don't be afraid of them. The Lord had already seen the harvest. All he has to do is be faithful. Put yourself out there, Paul. I'm going to use you. I'm going to speak through you. Just go. Trust God with the results. The Lord said in Matthew 9, 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I like how Paul starts this all off with the word finally. You know, it's, I can't tell you how many times people have told me how many times I say finally in a speech, in a message. And, and I will tell you that 1 Thessalonians 4.1 is a great example of this where the Apostle Paul uses the word finally and then goes on for two more chapters. So he's got a preacher's heart. He's got an evangelist's heart. That's what we do, right? We add the word finally, but what it means is to connect every single thing he's already taught into final application. It means as far as the rest is concerned. Everything I've been talking about, here's the application of it, and he's drilling it down to these five verses of all we have read thus far. And I love the fact that Paul doesn't assume anything. Even though the Lord has already seen the harvest, is with him, he knows that he needs the prayers of the saints. Sometimes we get into this attitude, well, God's already seen everything, knows everything, so why do I have to be specific or even pray at all? We talked about that a few weeks ago. Let me give you a visual for this. None of this will make any sense unless you have a visual before you. Imagine, well, let me, you want to take a little field trip with me for a second? Okay, let's do a field trip. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4 with me. Matthew, Matthew 4. Do you remember what's going on in Matthew chapter 4? This is where Satan attempts to tempt Jesus, and he fails. But he puts out the temptation in hopes that Jesus will fail, and then the whole universe will destroy itself, right? Because God has to be faithful and true, and the Lord cannot lie. And so if the Lord gives to any one of his baits, then God is defeated, and the whole universe is destroyed. Um, so it's very important that the Lord have victory in this. Verse 7, Matthew chapter 4, everybody there? Let me show you the arrogance of Satan for a moment, as if you need to be reminded of how arrogant he is. Jesus said to him, verse 7, Matthew 4, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now look how arrogant he is. He thinks that all of these cities belong to him. Now imagine if he's looking out over Colorado Springs and he's looking out even over your house and he thinks that that belongs to him. How do you feel about that? You should be rightly upset by such arrogance. And you're like, my house doesn't belong to him. Amen. Amen. But this is his arrogance. Now, what I want you to visualize in your mind with me for a moment how many houses are in Colorado Springs? A lot. That's right. You know I'm going to give you a number. 197,571, according to the last numbers. 197,000 houses. Now, picture we all lived in one giant apartment building of 197,000 units. <laughs> that is one big apartment building. Now, imagine that you're just one of the tenants inside this apartment building. And this guy just shows up, and he thinks he's the landlord and owner of this complex. Provides no paperwork, starts dictating everything to everybody, tells everybody they got to turn the lights out and live in the darkness in all 197,000 units. And then somebody tells you that you're under new ownership, and you decide to turn your light on. Huh, you rebel, you. You turned your light on, and now your unit is brightly illuminated amongst the 197,000 units. And what do you think the owner or the owner is going to feel about that? I told everybody lights out. It's going to be darkness in here only. What do you think you're doing turning your light on? So you go up to the judge. You have an appointment with the judge, and you go see him. According to Zechariah chapter 3, we get an image of the courtroom of heaven. And you go up to the judge, and you said, I have read this, and I know this word to be true. I have the right now by you, 
by your word to turn the light on because I'm no longer in darkness and I'm in light. And the judge says, yes, and gives him permission to do that. He goes back to his little apartment. He says, the judge said I could turn my light on, to which this landlord owner is now disgruntled. But he is rendered powerless because the judge said you could turn your light on. But you're not just satisfied with turning your light on. Oh, no. You decide you're going to go across the hall and tell other tenants about the fact that you're under new ownership. So you try to encourage them to turn their lights on too. And now all of a sudden, your whole floor, everybody starts flipping their lights on. What do you think that this landlord owner of the building is going to feel about that? Oh, he's getting even more upset. So he decides, well, I have no power. The judge has already rendered me powerless in this situation. So I'm going to make it even more difficult. I'm going to make sure all the lights in the hallway are off. And the carpet is all crooked and messed up so they trip. I'm going to make sure the elevators don't work so they can't get to another floor. That's exactly what the enemy of our souls does. Tries to make it as difficult as possible. But you've ever lived in apartment life? You start making posters. You want to gather everybody to the commune area. And you want to tell them more about the new owner who's given you permission to turn the light on in your particular space. And now maybe you get a whole floor that's illuminated. Why don't we have that same kind of attitude in Colorado Springs or wherever God puts us? That we want to tell everybody about the new ownership that we're under. We want to tell everybody about the new landlord who truly owned it all to begin with and will liberate and set them free. And they don't have to be under the shackles anymore and live in darkness anymore, but they can live in the light. And so when you pray, you are going before the judge and you are specifically outlining exactly what you seek in that situation. Do you think you would show up to a judge today in El Paso County completely unprepared? Do you think you're just going to wing it? No. If it's something important, you would prepare. You would have everything spelled out. Why don't we do likewise before the judge of the universe? And list it all out. Let me give you an example. I had received paperwork whenever you have an exempt property in Colorado. You have to go through an assessment of everything. They give you the longitude, latitude of every foot, it seems, of every area. So this is a three-acre campus. So they give you the entire outline and all the longitude, latitude, and it's completely spelled out to say this area is exempt. Have you ever tried to pray like that over your house? Now imagine if you started to realize, wait a minute, this house doesn't belong to the one who thinks he owns it all. This house belongs to the Lord. And now I'm a caretaker of this house. Now you might be more mindful of what comes through the television or what comes through the radio. If you even still listen to radio anymore, which I hope you do, because we're on the radio. But whatever that is, whatever content is coming into your house, if it doesn't belong to you, you're a caretaker of it because it belongs to the Lord, then you might be more mindful of what is going on in it. We did the same thing over this church. All of that belongs to you, Lord. We are but stewards of what you have given. This doesn't belong to Satan. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to the board. We are stewards of him, and this belongs to him. And so you just give that specificity. It matters. Go before the judge. Render the enemy powerless. Now you know that you communicated to the judge. So when he tries whispering in your ear, it is like, well, you didn't say that. Or did you? Because now you know without a doubt. That's why I often write down my prayers. Write it down. We, we read that in Habakkuk 2 too, don't we? Write it down so that he who reads it may run. Maybe it's you who need to do the running. Running for the glory of the Lord. So be specific. Watch God work in this. The Apostle Paul calls it the word of the Lord. It's not just anybody's word. It's the Lord's word. Everything we're talking about here, it belongs to the Lord. You're but a steward of it to run for his glory. He wants everybody to know that the debt has been paid. Jesus paid the debt for all of us. He gave himself on a cross. He died on that cross. He took the shame upon himself, the punishment of our sins upon himself. And now we have the privilege to go to all the other tenants in the apartment building and say, your debt has been paid. Turn the lights on. Live in the freedom that only Jesus Christ can give you. Why would you not want to share that with every person that you encounter? 
1 Thessalonians 1.9, Paul highlighted the fact that when the truth is given, change happens. As were some of you. He says, the word of the Lord be glorified just as it is with you. When they received the word, they departed from all of their pagan worship. Change happened. They weren't in the system anymore. They were thinking differently. They didn't buy into the lies of Babylon. They didn't worship the false gods of Babylon anymore. It was only the true God of heaven and earth. When the word comes, change happens. When Paul was in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, we read of a riot breaking out because Paul was giving the gospel. He was giving the gospel and people were believing it. So much so that idol sales were dropping. Could you imagine if you were out there sharing the gospel and all of a sudden people stopped going to strip clubs and bars? And then all of a sudden the owners of all of those establishments would then be going, hey, we got to do something about these Christians. Sales are dropping and I'm losing my business. And that's exactly what they did. And they established a riot, got people together to start trying to throw them out. We read in Acts chapter 19 of what was going on then. Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, we don't know what kind of silver coinage this was, but if it was a drachma, then that's a one day's wage. 50,000 days of working that they just burned in the sight of everybody because they believed in Jesus. They believed the gospel. We could see change like that today. Can you imagine what even this one church could do in Colorado Springs filled with the Holy Spirit? Paul asked them, pray that the word of the Lord will run swiftly and be glorified. Some think that, well, because he was there in Corinth, which was the capital of the Isthmian Games, like the Olympics, that maybe he was using the imagery like 1 Corinthians 9, where we all run a race, but only one receives the prize, but we an imperishable wreath. Maybe he was using that kind of imagery of outrunning your opponents. I believe that he possibly had Psalm 147 in mind, where he says, Sin, he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. Now, why would he say that? When God issues a decree, it will go forth. I feel like the enemy is trying to get his message into the hands of people faster than ever. When men back in the day were addicted to pornography, they would at least have to go to a blockbuster or wherever they found their pornography and get a video cassette or get a magazine or whatever those things were to try to entertain the flesh. Now, if you have access to the internet, it can be there as fast as you can think it. So the enemy is quite deliberate with getting his filth into the hands of people as fast as possible. Why do we not have the same urgency with the gospel message? It must go forth swiftly because lives depend on it. And if the enemy is that intentional with his message, we ought to be even more so with the truth that is in us. Is a very serious thing. Now the Apostle Paul makes mention here of the fact that even as he goes forth, that the Lord does not press upon the hearts of those who hear, then they will not receive. So he knows it's not in his own strength. Even a willing vessel going forth to give the gospel, the Lord has to precede them. The Lord is the one who draws men in. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts the hearts of men. So all these things must be prayed for with specificity. Pray these things and watch God work. He says, verse 2, and that they may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Ooh, there's an image right there that some may be the appearance or have the appearance of being religious or faith-filled individuals, but they are not. And today, you are saturated with it. If you just turn on YouTube, you will find everybody spewing all kinds of things, and they may sound fantastic. They may have a gift of oration and homiletics and have no substance and preach a different gospel. When Paul left Galatia, almost immediately, false teachers came in and started saying something like this, if you have faith, you will be saved. But, oh, there it is, 
you have to also be circumcised and you have to practice some of the laws. Oh, they were creating a hybrid covenantal agreement. Christ was not enough. They needed to add a little bit of the law and, and then they could have Jesus too. So do this and do this and you'll be saved. Paul writes to them, Galatians 1, 6 to 9, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, meaning there aren't more than one gospels. There's only one. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say it again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. There are many gospels being preached today. If you believe in Jesus, you'll have wealth and prosperity. Oh, if you believe in Jesus and add enough good works, you'll eventually earn enough merit to get out of purgatory. Or you'll even hear things like word of faith, kingdom now, new apostolic reformation. Not only are these lies, but they're perpetuated by those who lie. And you need to avoid it at all costs. Get away from that. You need the substance right here in God's holy word. So you got to pray that the true gospel goes forth, not a perversion of it, not something that sounds like Greco-Roman philosophy interwoven into it. We've been covering that on the radio, which you may not actually listen to anymore. But if you actually listen to the radio, we've been talking about this, of the history of the Bible and how many other texts tried to be added into the Scripture. Ancient texts, over 52 of them, were pulled out and said, no, this is not canon. This is men's philosophy that we're trying to make the truth more palatable to the ears of men. And we still do that today. Keep trying to add things to the Word of God. Ugh, it is a lie. Jesus warned that false prophets would emerge. Matthew 7, verse 15, disguised as sheep, but they'd actually be wolves. And the Apostle Paul warns the elders of this in Acts 20. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. He reminds the church in Corinth and 2 Corinthians that Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light and those who serve him as ministers of righteousness. How then do you discern? Because you take it to the word like the Bereans did. Hold it all accountable to the truth. And then we pray for those who give this message. May they be firm and not deviate. May they keep advancing the gospel and not retract out of fear. Pray that God will protect them because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, according to Ephesians 6. So you can't be a turtle. It's not time to retract. It's time to be bold, not bold arrogantly, bold because you have the truth. And if you believe it, if you know it, then you will speak it. But if you're blurry in things, and you're a little unsure about what you believe, you'll tend to retract because you don't want to get into those heated discussions where you will feel like you don't know and you're unprepared. So you got to spend time in the Word. I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget things. So we got to get in the Word all the time, in the Word and of the Word. So we got to pray for boldness. We read in Acts chapter 4, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Not one of us in this room can say we can't do it. It doesn't matter whether you've been to seminary or not. If you're a willing vessel saying, here I am, Lord, send me, he says that he will put his words to your lips. He will do this work to bring glory to himself through you. There is no excuse in this. The Holy Spirit will empower. I love this in 2 Corinthians 3.12. He says, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. If you know what you believe, speak it. Tell the other tenants. Tell them to turn the light on. Now is the time. 
Don't hide in the darkness. I love how the Lord receives all the glory here, the prominence. Verse 1, the word of the Lord. Verse 2, the Lord is faithful. Verse 4, we have confidence in the Lord. Verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts. He's receiving no credit for this. It's all the Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He gets all the glory. And just like He will for you, working through you. The second point, we finally arrive at the second point. Uh oh, I said finally. <laughs> but I don't mean it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, where are we getting there? <laughs> point number two pray for the perseverance of the saints. So you've been praying for faithfulness, now you've got to pray for perseverance. That's what we're going to see here in these other three verses. Verse three But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. You read a verse like that, and on the surface level, you may be asking, then why are there so many martyrs? Why does it feel like every time I talk to a Christian, they're going through such hardship? If you promise, Lord, that you will establish us and guard us from the evil one, why does it feel like evil is winning? Those are great questions, aren't they? I was hoping you might be able to tell me. <laughs> no, the Word tells us enough exactly what we need to know. Paul turns our attention to the faithfulness of the Lord in this, asking prayer for protection to deliver the word, but it's interesting because here he doesn't ask for prayer and of, over himself and his own protection. He's praying they pray for their own protection. It's interesting because it's the pastoral heart. He cares that they stay faithful to the Lord, that they pray for their own perseverance in this. Note these three things. God's faithfulness is the foundation for standing firm in the spiritual battle. It's God's faithfulness. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. We're reminded of that in 1 Thessalonians 5, that God is the faithful one. The Lord is faithful. You know, I, I think about uh, Jeremiah when he was, he was one of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Isaiah and Jeremiah were before and right up to the point when Israel was about to go into Babylonian captivity. And then Ezekiel would be the one who's prophesying to them while they're in captivity. So Jeremiah had been warning them, you've got to turn from what you're doing. You've got to turn away from your sin. And if you don't, these things are going to happen. Can you imagine how he must have felt as he's watching the city burn? as he watches the temple get torn down, as men are slaughtered, and then the rest taken into captivity. How would you feel if you saw this happening even over this city? And the burden that he must have felt. He's so burdened that he writes Lamentations, I believe him to be the author of it. He says in chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, that while he is seeing the city burn, while he's seeing what looks like the enemy winning, he says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. That in the midst of sorrows, He would keep His eyes on God. You have promised you will deliver. He is working all things to the good of those who love him who are called according to his purposes. Established means he's going to give you solid footing. To guard you does not mean that you will not go into the battle space. So often we think that we should be on the hilltop somewhere while the battles are happening somewhere else and somebody else dealing with it. And that's not what we see through Israel's history at all or even through church history. To the contrary, we're right in the battlefield, but the Lord is our guard. He tells us in Luke 21, 16 to 17, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Boy, the Lord just knew how to encourage them. No, he's telling them the truth. You live in a foreign space of darkness representing the light. This is what you ought to expect. You've turned the light on in your little apartment. You've got 197,000 other homes to go. And you've got to walk out into those hallways where the enemy's trying to wrinkle up the carpet to cause you to trip. 
making sure the elevator doesn't go up or down, make sure the lights are just flickering, maybe just enough to annoy you, and all these things that keep you from giving the gospel message because you will notice that the more you get involved and start doing the Lord's work, the battle seems to amplify, doesn't it? So what are you going to do about that? Turn into a turtle and retract? Or are you going to advance bold as a lion with the truth that is in you? In Romans chapter 11, he gives us an answer to something that people have not understood for some time, is why does Israel have to suffer under the Antichrist? Why, do he, why does he even be given this power and then two-thirds of Israel slain? How does that bring about God's glorious purposes? We find in Romans chapter 11 that through such suffering, they will finally acknowledge the true Messiah, the one whom they pierced. They will acknowledge, they will humble themselves, and all of the tribes will be saved. All of them. Not one will be lost. Not every person will be saved, but every tribe will be saved. God is going to bring it to pass. And sometimes through suffering is when these things happen, when men finally repent. And when you stand for righteousness and give the gospel, sometimes even through martyrdom, we find the gospel is advanced all the more. Even if he preserves your flesh, the gospel will still be advanced all the more. But it's all about the gospel. The Lord will preserve you because the enemy cannot take your soul. He may come against your flesh, but you have a place that is prepared for you. The Lord gives great commendation to those who stand up and are battled for the truth that is in them. And this is greatly commendable by God. He says in Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. You're like, I'm not very encouraged by that. You ought to be because he knows you by name. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what you look like, what you're going through. You are not alone. Whatever you're battling through right now is going to bring him glory. He is going to refine you, sanctify you, and whatever adversity you're going through and giving the gospel message, he will be glorified through that too. He knows it all, and he is with you. So ongoing obedience is next, is the framework for standing firm in spiritual battle. Ongoing obedience is critical in this. He says here, verse 4, and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. It almost sounds like a parent walking out for the evening and looking at the teenagers. You're going to do what I told you, and you're going to will do what I told you, right? And I'm going to come back, and the house will still be standing, and everything's going to be in order because you did exactly what I told you to do. And you can almost imagine the Apostle Paul walking through this church right now. You're going to do what the Lord told you to do, Right? Some people may say, well, that just sounds legalistic. There's 1,236 commands that are given to us in the New Testament. Those are broken down from 214 that are repeated over and over again. It's not for salvation, it's because of salvation that we do. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, because he knows what's in your best interest. Listen, I have a... Um, I have a son whom I'm very well proud, proud of to great extent, beyond words, who serves in Colorado Springs Police Department. How do you think he would feel if I started driving on the wrong side of the road, running every red light, and didn't obey any of the traffic laws because the person who pulled me over said, hey, my son's in law enforcement, I get a pass. No, I bring shame to him and everything that he's doing for this city and this community by taking advantage of what I think is a get-out-of-jail-free card. Shame on me if I were to do such a thing. Not to mention, the Lord just may allow me to get into a traffic accident, and you imagine how many people would be affected by me driving on the wrong side of the road. Do you think your sins affect you alone? I can't think of a single sin that just impacts the person sinning. They always impact everybody else around them. Imagine how much damage I would do in this city if I did that. So how often do we come to the Lord and we just say, well, because of all the grace you've given me, and because, you know, you're going to save me and all, I can kind of just run basically off emotion in this. And, you know, I, I saw the Bible summarized on a TikTok video, so I think I'm good. <laughs> As opposed to studying His Word, knowing His Word, and operating from His Word because you're an ambassador of another kingdom. 
So we have a responsibility with this to do as he's instructed because he knows what is in your best interest. But so often we just take it as suggestion instead of doing what we know we ought to do. And even going to this book and saying, well, there's another instruction. I haven't been doing that one. I'll take it under consideration as opposed to doing as he's told us to do. You know, I encountered a young man the other day who told me that his fiance isn't a Christian. But he said, I prayed, and marrying her gives me such peace. So it must be God's will. Well, wait a minute. The word of the Lord says in 2 Corinthians 6.14 that we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So basically, it's premeditated sin. That I only want what I want, not your kingdom to come, but I want my kingdom to come. And I'm going to twist your scripture to justify my position of sin. That's basically like telling the Lord, I'm going to go get in trouble, get into mischief, and I want you to protect me, Lord. And so often we find ourselves doing that when we, the, tr- the truth is before us. And so the Apostle Paul, walking through our ranks, just like in Thessalonica, says, you must do as you've been instructed to do. It brings glory to God when you do. Now, are you going to fall short? Yes. But we don't give in to premeditated sin. And when we fall short, we repent. We say, Lord, strengthen me so that I don't hurt your heart tomorrow or hurt my testimony tomorrow. I've already hurt that enough. But no more, Lord. To you be the glory. And, and of course, are we going to blow it tomorrow? Yes. But sometimes we may blow it a little less. To God be the glory. And then finally in this, we see, oh, there I said it again, finally, oh boy. He wants to point us to God's love and Jesus' patience, steadfastness. It becomes the fuel for standing firm in the spiritual battle space. Listen to what he says here, verse 5. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So where is he directing us? To the love of God. Of all the things to stand firm in the spiritual battle, you need to be in the Lord's embrace for this, in his agape love, so that this will strengthen you like none other. If you've had a long day at work, and you know that there's a spouse awaiting you when you get home, and dinner's prepared, and things are right, and the aroma is good, it can be a motivation to get home all the more. And this is the kind of love where God saturates us with an agape love and it should fuel us to run the race, to persevere to the very end, knowing that when we graduate from this flesh or when we are raptured away, that we have the open arms of Jesus ready to receive us. Well done, good and faithful servant. Should that not be motivation enough? To say you didn't trade off your 80, 90, or 100 years for eternity. You sacrificed this much for all this. Well done to run the race. Oh, it's worth it. So he directs us right back to the arms of our Lord in his love. That's exactly where we need to be. He then says he wants us to see here the patience of our Lord. I I find that one is an interesting one because commentators are torn on that. To direct us into the steadfastness or patience of the Lord. Some have wondered, is that his waiting to come and get us? That he's patient as the bridegroom waiting to come and get his bride? And he's just as eager to receive you unto himself as we are to be with him? Or is this also an image here of the Lord's patience knowing before as time began that he was going to have to go to that cross for you? And that all that suffering would have to take place for a greater purpose. That we likewise, as we suffer perhaps even a momentary trial, knowing that this is not in vain, that we have the same patience of Christ, that it is for a glorious purpose. Something greater is on the horizon. Can you be steadfast as Christ is steadfast for you? That's quite a challenge to us all. So in conclusion... Finally, we pray that the word of the Lord be spread. Rather than just saying, Lord, pray for, we, please bless all the missionaries. Maybe you try to adopt a missionary, and by name, you ask the Lord to cover them. And you labor with them through your prayers and your support. And you give no night or day without having given them to the Lord in prayer to cover that faithfulness. 
Maybe you pray for those who are given the gospel right here in our city as this church even goes forth, that all of us got to be a part of what happened yesterday. Because of your faithful support, by your prayers, even the Apostle Paul said that those who gave were also recipients of the blessing because we're all in it together for the good work that's being done. It's not that so 12 people could be elevated above somebody else. It's that a whole family got to be a part of this in doing this glorious work. So pray that the gospel continues to go forth wherever you are. Fight the good fight. Let me leave you with this fun story. I, you know, I like to geek out over fun, like, cool things. Um, in 1972, going back before I was born, 72, NASA launched an exploratory space probe, Pioneer 10. Pioneer 10. The satellite's primary mission was to reach Jupiter, but at that particular time, nothing had passed Mars because they were afraid of the asteroid belt that anything they might build would actually get destroyed in the asteroid belt and never actually meet its destination, never reach it. So Pioneer 10 was one of the first. It actually made it past the asteroid belt on its way to Jupiter. Well, it arrived in November of 1973. They wanted all these images of the magnetic field, radiation belts, atmosphere, and it sent back images of Jupiter like we'd never seen before. But it didn't stop there. They hadn't planned on this, that the planet was so big and its gravity so intense that Pioneer 10 actually slingshotted past Jupiter. So after seeing all of these wonderful photos, it kept sending images back to Earth. It went out and brought back images of the rest of the solar system. Saturn, um, it went back all the way to Pluto. By the time it got to Pluto, that was 4 billion miles away. And it kept sending images back. It kept going. By 1997, 25 years later, it had already reached a, a, a 6 billion miles away. And it kept sending images back. And you're thinking, well, okay, that sounds great. If you were an engineer, you would appreciate why this is so amazing. They only designed that probe to last for three years. 25 years and counting, it was still sending images back to the earth. And what's really mind-boggling is the camera system that it used was 8 watts. That's about the power of your nightlight on the side of your bed in your bedroom. And with that power alone, it kept going and going and going. It became known as the little satellite that could. Now, with that, I have to believe that so often many of us come to the table to meet with the Lord, and we think of ourselves as no better than an 8-watt camera that have absolutely no capabilities to even go the distance or do anything for the Lord because we think, well, I haven't even been to seminary, so what can I possibly say or do for the kingdom? And I tell you, brothers and sisters, to the contrary, as the Lord has given you breath to your bodies, He can use you for His glorious purposes. Do you believe it? Do you believe what we've been talking about, Jesus Christ our Lord? Then don't let anything hinder the joy of helping other tenants turn on the light when their landlord wants to keep them in darkness. I want to challenge you with this. Don't be the one who quits. May your heart be, Lord, here I am, send me. A room full of eight-watt cameras. Let's go forth with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be 25 years or more that you keep faithfully serving, no matter the distance, no matter how hard it might be, no matter how many times you may feel alone, you are not alone. God is with you, and God will be glorified through you. Amen? Amen. As we close, we've got Paul and Shirley over here. They're our prayer team this morning. And so as you may need some prayer, I hope that you do. That you're not ashamed to pray with somebody else who will lift your arms on high like Aaron and her for Moses. To keep praying, to labor for the good mission, the cause of Christ that is before us. Let's pray and we'll sing together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of being able to gather together with the saints. Thank you, Father, that we have this privilege. I pray that we not take it for granted. Father, we ask that you would continue to be lifted high in our homes that if we have forgotten that you are our first love, that our homes belong to you, I pray, Father, that that would change today. 
that you, O Lord, would make our living room likened to a sanctuary. And I pray, Father, we'd be unashamed of the gospel that's in us. Father, would you please continue to lift up just the, the, te- the people in Israel as they're going through great adversity and often feel alone and the battle is real. I pray, Father, that you'd bring many to salvation. Give wisdom to leaders. Bring yourself glory through that series of conflict. I pray, Father, you would do the same here at home, right here in our backyard in the city of Colorado Springs and beyond. I pray, Father, that we would all be burdened to pray for our leaders, to pray for our first responders, to pray for change right here in this community in Fountain Security, Wide Field, Colorado Springs and beyond. I pray, Father, we would pray for this state, that we'd be burdened for its leaders, that you would saturate them with truth, surround them with truth speakers. And all the way up to the highest offices in this nation, I pray, Lord, you would do a mighty work to change this nation back to you. Father, would you please burden our hearts to pray these things with specificity. We give this to you all in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. my precious friends, if you would be um, so kind, this, I promise, is no longer than a closing song, okay? But we're going to listen to something really special. I think. It says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now, obviously, the he in this story is Jesus, because we're celebrating Palm Sunday, the first day of the most important week in the history of the world, the day that Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, ultimately to give his life, to be buried in our tomb, to be raised from the dead by the power of God. And a great crowd had gathered on this day. It was the Passover festival, and Jews had come from all over the known world. Hundreds of thousands of people were in the city of Jerusalem, and they had heard about who's coming. This man who walks on water, he has healed the sick, he's fed multitudes, calmed the storm, he has even raised the dead, and now he is coming into the city. They've heard that he's Messiah, maybe, king of the Jews, and so they're preparing the way with palm branches on the road, and they're expecting a regal and a royal entrance, but Jesus, it says in the next verse, chose to ride on the colt of a donkey. Now, I asked today, what king rides into town on a donkey? There was no grand stallion. There were no flanking guards. There was no trumpet sound. It was just Jesus riding in low because he had come to be king, but he was a servant king. And he'd said about himself, I've not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And Jesus knew this day that he was riding into Jerusalem, not to be crowned, but to be crucified, to give his life for the sins of the world. He knew that he would be the final Passover lamb. And so today we celebrate the king who stooped low to serve you and me, to lift us out of death and into eternal life by the gift of his own innocent life. And we celebrate today that Jesus is still riding into towns and riding into stories and riding into circumstances. And he's riding into your life today, wherever you are, with truth and grace and redemption, power and life and hope. Welcome him in today, the servant king, Jesus, giving his life for the sins of the world. Amen, right? Amen. Yeah, go ahead and stand and let's go ahead and worship. Mm. And really quickly, if you haven't made that decision yet, if you're just still questioning about what it is to have the Lord be your Lord and Savior, please don't leave. Come talk to us. Come with the prayer team, whatever it be, all right?
Father, Lord, we, we love you. We love you and we thank you for all you've done, all you are about to do. Lord, I pray for each and every one of my brothers and sisters here today, Lord, that as they go through the week, that there just be such an incredible opportunity of refinement, of transparency, of going deeper with you, Father God. And again, I do pray that if there is anybody, Lord God, that's just kind of a little hesitant, a little scared of trusting you, Lord, I pray that that wall would come down and that they would be able to know you are good, you are faithful, you are just, and you never, ever leave us nor forsake us. Again, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a very blessed day, and I, I feel like I should have you guys tell me. And what am I going to tell you? Don't let the worship, what? Stop here. <laughs> have a blessed one.